Soccer Hangouts. I'm Mason Raymond with Oliver Platts, our One Soccer analyst and hip hop enthusiast, as well as uh, commentator Adam Jenkins and uh, aviation aficionado. And a special guest today, Lucas Cavallini of the Vancouver Whitecaps, also known as El Tanque, the tank. Where does the nickname come from? Hey, hey guys, um, thanks for inviting me on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming going, on. yeah, going back to when I just started playing in Uruguay. Um, the, the first training session, you know, I really set like a standard for myself and uh, just had a really good practice. I remember we were having a scrimmage and I was, I was doing well. And, um, you know, just from being just big physical and just <laughs> getting through everybody, you know, they, that's where the name started from. Yeah, we love watching. Uh, so appealing to the eye. Uh, but 11 years ago, yeah, you left Canada as a 16-year-old, uh, went on to play in Uruguay as well in, uh, in Mexico with Liga Max. How does it feel uh, to be back home and playing in Canada with the Vancouver Whitecaps? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's different compared to what I've been used to. Um, the Latino culture, you know, uh, coming home now 11 years later, it, it's different for me. It's a new challenge, but you know, I'm I'm ready for 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 anything, and I I like uh, accepting challenges like these. Yeah, a real challenge right now, like the rest of us, uh, dealing with uh, isolation, uh, being at home. Uh, how are you coping with that? How are you uh, keeping busy and active and staying fit? Yeah, you know, you know, it's 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 not bad for me. You know, uh, just staying positive, as you said. Um, I usually train in the mornings. Uh, the Whitecaps send each of each of the players a little program to do. So usually in the morning when I have time before the kids wake up, I, I hop on uh, my, my session. And then uh, and then after that, you know, I'm just a stay at home dad. Now now I have to <laughs> now, now I have to homeschool my, my my oldest. So you know the days have been busy for me. I've got uh, I've got two kids as well, Lucas, a five year old and a seven year old. That's been the hardest thing. Uh, what's the, the toughest thing to teach the kids right now? No, since my, just my oldest is in school. The other two are still small. I have a yeah. two-year-old and a, I have the five-year-old that's in SK. And then I have the two-year-old and six months that are still playing around the house. But no, the, it's, it's not that hard. You know, it's activities, fun activities. Um, you know, you just, you just feel that uh, relationship, uh, trying to it's something yeah. different you know just homeschooling your child it's, it's something different yeah it's different for all of us um how do you think and this is a discussion for all of us ollie adam chime in as well um how do you think uh the coronavirus will affect sports when we when we ever return uh, to sports and you return to playing lucas so what sort of impact do you think uh, it'll have hopefully it doesn't affect nothing uh yeah Obviously, the break has been has been irritating for a lot of people. You know, the world needs football. Football needs the world. You know, so mm -hmm. it, this it's going to be longer than than what it what it is now apparently. But uh, you know, um, I know everybody's going to be anxious to get back on the pitch, and I know the fans are going to go crazy for, 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 to see a game eventually. But uh, but you never know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what time tells. Yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty interesting because one, one of the things I've been thinking about is that you see the Bundesliga getting back into camp now and obviously they can play in, in empty stadiums and they can survive on TV money. But then there's other leagues that maybe require ticket sales and, and gate receipts a little bit more. So that would be tougher for them. And I'm not a scientist, but as I understand it, we're likely to kind of see the curve flatten. And then in a few months time, it might kind of peak a little bit again and, and we might have a couple more um, rises of it. So mm -hmm how the leagues kind of manage getting fans back into stadiums is, is going to be pretty interesting. Um, Lucas, for you, what's it like to, to play in an empty stadium? How would you feel about potentially yeah. going back to, to empty stadiums to begin with? Um, well, you know, uh, the most important thing in life is everybody's health. So yeah. if it's a matter of uh, keeping the players safe, keeping the people from, you know, bringing back this virus, um, you know, I, I'm fine with it. Obviously, but I have experience. I have experience playing in an empty stadium in Uruguay. Uh, the fans were banned just for 
uh, polemic reasons. And, um, you know, it's, it's something, <laughs> it's not normal. It, it's like, it, it's, it's weird. You can hear the crickets <laughs> on the, <laughs> but it, it's, you know, the fans, the football needs the fans. It's like they're player number 12 for us. So, um, it, it, it's going to be different. It's going to be awkward, but, uh, a game's a game. So we just have to go out and win. Yeah. All we need to worry about. Yeah, think I think the. Sorry, Adam, go ahead. No, I was gonna say I think the closed door stadiums. It's like everyone's gonna be excited at first to be back. They're like, yes, this is amazing. Finally, we have football again. But when the atmosphere is flat and it's quiet, and I think after a while, people are gonna start to get really antsy to be back. The like closed doors won't be enough. It's just gonna be that taste of what's more. I'm more curious to see what's gonna happen when fans are allowed back in how yeah. the player and fan interaction goes i mean lucas i'd love to hear your comments on this but even players after anthems are they the handshake is that still going to exist or fans asking you for a selfie are you going to feel comfortable with that close interaction with people where you don't know where they've been yeah you know then again um we have to see what happens in the future uh with all this uh with all, with all this being said you know uh like I said, the number, the most important thing here is everybody's health. And obviously it's going to be uncomfortable at first because everybody's used to the social distancing and all that, but hopefully everything goes well and we can get back to our normal lives, you know, yeah. that interaction with fans and players. And that's something us players miss just as much as the fans. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that's part of what makes football football, right? So, I mean, if you take away that engagement, that's, why a lot of players like yourself are heroes to so many young kids and fans, especially because they know that they are able to have that interaction with you, that they're able to be that close. So you're right. It's going to be a weird bubble at first when you get back, when you're like, hi, great to see you, but keep your distance until we know we're in the clear here. Yeah. We're swapping jerseys. I wonder if uh, players would be swapping yeah. jerseys. <laughs> let's say, let's yeah. just say we could change one thing about the game, not to, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus uh, related, but if you could change the game or one aspect of the game, Ollie, um, what would it be? Have some fun uh, with this one. Yeah, there's a lot of places you Easy. could go with this. <laughs> Sorry? Lucas got one already. Easy. Easy? Go All ahead, right. go ahead. I've got an idea I want to pitch to you here, Lucas. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this as a player. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things you could change about football, so I'm, I'm not going for necessarily the most serious one, but for me, I would like to see a rule change that I think would change the game quite a lot, which is awarding a red card for a tactical foul. So by a tactical mm. foul, I'm talking about um, a deliberate foul that stops a counterattack. Um, if there's an attempt to play the ball, I don't mind that, but just fouls to deliberately stop a counterattack. And I think there's something that's become more common in the game. Um, so there's kind of a moral side of it that maybe teams are accepting that trade-off now, and, and that mm. is, is a problem. But the bigger part of it for me, and, and the reason I'd be interested to see this in, in effect, is that I think, you know, 10 years ago, you had teams like Barcelona, very technical, possession-based teams. And then over the past few years, the reaction to that has been teams that press just like crazy, try and stop those teams playing out of the back, try and disrupt them. Um, and I think the game is getting a lot more physical as a result of that. So for me... Um, eliminating these tactical fouls wouldn't eliminate pressing, but it may kind of limit how effective it is. And we may allow more technical players, uh, you know, more expressive players to, to maybe flourish a bit more than they do in the, in, in the game as it's going right now. Um, so that would be the one change I'd make. Lucas, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that or what you think about those kind of fouls and, and whether they should be punished more severely. Um, yeah, you have a point a little bit, um, you know, yeah, it, especially when it, they're fouls that are unacceptable, you know, that could prevent injuries, you know, dangerous tackles, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I've been on both sides of it. I've given the dangerous tackle and I've been receiving <laughs> dangerous tackles. But, so, you know, <laughs> it's part of the game to, today, uh, nowadays, you know. So, um, well, I guess you can say uh, it's something tactical as well to break their tactical yeah is yeah. <laughs> you know it's just uh but yeah you, you have a point there as well but i'm gonna have to say uh take out the var <laughs> get rid of it completely <laughs> i thought we might get to that <laughs> yeah. I, i'm gonna tell you why um we grew up playing football like football's 
been around for a long, sorry my dog's here been around <laughs> long for a long time obviously the history of football is it's all natural it's what the referee sees <laughs> obviously there's some po- polemic sides obviously you know every game there's someone complaining about oh it should have been a penalty and that's when they brought in the VAR mm-hmm. but since the VAR has been around I think um, it has slowed down the game a little bit there it has been less like intense you know it just when there's like a high momentum in the game and somebody gets tackled in the box the referee says continue goes to the other side counter attack stuff like that you know that that moment that adrenaline in the game it's it's missing because mm-hmm. they stop it just to make a VAR call and it'll be like five minutes reviewing the, the the call and all that you know it just for me as a player being on the pitch it just kills my momentum even like if it's a penalty that's going to be awarded for me or against me I just feel the same thing like yeah. it just kills the adrenaline fun. It impacts the, the fan experience too, right? Because the same sort of thing. You have this momentous goal and everyone's excited, uh, but then you have to wait to make sure that the player was on side before you really invest in the goal and want to celebrate it. Exactly. No, yeah. Not only that, the VAR in Mexico, they canceled like five goals of mine. I have to, <laughs> so I have it's to personal. Bad calls. Personal note. No, it's not personal either because they were bad calls. So the VAR can... I don't know. I don't know why they're there sometimes because they won't make the right call at all. Sometimes it's all political. For me, even when the VAR, sorry, Lucas, for for me, even when the VAR VAR is right, there are certain decisions offsides that are just a fraction of an inch. I I don't care that those are offside. I'd rather those goals stand for me personally. Mm -hmm. I think it takes something away from the game that we're getting so picky about offsides. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to go on the VAR train too, just to say, if they're going to do it, if, if this is the future, it's it's here to stay, then enhance it. I like the rugby style of TMO, where when they're going to that re- video review room, it's up on the big screen, the referee's looking at it, and on the broadcast, you can hear the communication between VAR and the ref. So you're at least getting the referee's mindset. I agree that I'm fine to not have it there, but if it's going to be there, let's make it better. Hell, throw in a coach's challenge where if yeah. they can challenge a foul, they can challenge an offside. But if they're wrong, other team gets a PK. Like, this is drama. Let's build to that. I love these kinds of tinkering with the game questions, mostly because I know they're never going to happen and they can be outlandish. But for the sake of that argument, let's completely get rid of PKs in games where they matter. No World Cup should ever be decided by a skills competition. Mm-hmm. My yeah. same sort of views on the shootout in hockey. I mean, if you really want to find a result, take four players off the field, 7v7. I'm <laughs> limited substitutions have them win the game by playing soccer and not with pks i could do this argument all day this is <laughs> yeah. we've done. we didn't have time for it adam i love it though it's great <laughs> ideas we'll have to i like, like the golden goal another show mm-hmm. um, yeah. let's uh let's get a question from uh our youtube stream uh someone watching on youtube uh adam asks uh, who's the greatest player cavallini has played against and with Oof. played against um Played against, played against. Probably, oh, Jignac Gig, from Tigre. Yeah. yeah. Against, yeah. really good. And then with, probably, well, not at that time he wasn't, he was like at the end of his career, but yeah. obviously for me, he's one of a great, his greatest players, uh, Chino Ricoba. Yeah, Ricoba, yeah. Hold yeah. on, decent name. In his prime, in his prime, he was really good, so young early in your career so you've got uh, plenty of years left to uh, play against uh, more greats um let's let's find out how you ended up though in uruguay uh, 16 years old uh, in canada uh what was that journey like how did you end up uh, playing in uruguay yeah um when i was growing up in in toronto um i had i went changing teams local teams you know mm-hmm. uh, all that uh oisl type of leagues you know um mm-hmm. and uh and i ended up my last team i played for was clarkson and there i knew a coach that used to be my like personal trainer so he brought me to clarkson he was from argentina mm-hmm. um and then in clarkson there was already a coach there uh from uruguay uh and obviously they both uh tried to work together and build build a, a good club good institution and um 
and they told me to go to this club alongside Jonathan Osorio, mm-hmm. who was already there. And uh, they had this idea to go to South America to showcase uh, our team, I guess. And we ended up uh, going to play exhibition games in Argentina, in Uruguay. And um, we played teams, uh, River Plate, Independiente, um, Nacional, and Uruguay. And then, uh, and then since uh, one of their trainers uh, from Uruguay, George, uh, he really he had a lot of connections in Uruguay. He brought the national team to come play against us in Toronto. So we played a little tournament there. There was us, there was them, there was Spartacus, and there was another team. I don't remember who it was. Um, and we just had a little tournament going. And, you know, uh, from playing against Nacional, the, the coaches liked a lot of our players, yeah. uh, including Jonathan Osorio and myself and three other players. And basically, uh, the coach told us that we could uh, go on trial to, to Nacional to, to showcase what we have if we're able to, uh, if we're capable of uh, eventually staying there. And so that's that's how basically everything started. We went down and uh, we went for two months and 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 they liked us. Most most of us they liked. Uh, we we were five and they ended up picking four of us. And from then on, uh, there was there was one every year. One would leave. One would leave. Until at the end, it was just me. You know, obviously Jonathan Osorio took his other. He's doing yeah. well. Trying to see, you know, I'm proud of him. Things happen for reasons, you know. Um, and yeah, that's I ended up staying by myself and just starting a career for myself. Lucas, obviously those trials and the experiences playing against them here and traveling to South America to play must have helped you with your confidence and understanding of what you might be facing. But can you take us back to those trial days and what your mindset was? Was it still terrifying being in such a passionate country, knowing you're so close to making it, but so much rides on such a short window of time? Yeah, you know, as you said, I got some confidence from playing against them, uh, scoring goals in some games, and you know that just that just made me made me feel good. Like like I can be, I'm able to compete with these guys, so why can't I play alongside them? You know, so mm-hmm. basically, it was different. You know, different culture, different uh, different experiences. Uh, Jonathan could one day you could ask Jonathan. Jonathan. Uh, We'll back up on my answers here, but yeah, you know, living living wise, uh, it wasn't it wasn't Canada, you know. Uh, we were all used to that first first country stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. We're going to a third third world mm-hmm. country, different, everything different. Uh, I remember we had to uh, live in the residency of Nacional, and there was like a big. It was it wasn't a big house, but it was just like a. It was just like a military, there were just military bedrooms, you know, they would put like a small room with like five bud, bed, uh, what do you call them, bed bunks? Bunk beds, yeah. Bunk, bunk, beds, beds, yeah. Uh, bunk, bunk beds, bunk beds, sorry. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember we had to stay in this little room with, with, I remember I slept on the bot, on the top, I don't remember, it was just a mess. Yeah. And, you know, living wise, it didn't really matter because we knew we were doing something that was chasing our dreams in order to be a professional soccer player, you know? So obviously it didn't matter what our, what our, <laughs> my two-year-old. He's excited. It he, yeah, he's, I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't see him today. I just woke oh, okay. up there, you know? <laughs> So yeah, you know, it just didn't matter what was going on off the pitch. Because we knew right. on the pitch we wanted to become professionals, and this was a dream come true for us. And eventually, everything got better. You know, as, yeah. as you play, as you play better on the pitch, you know, your confidence goes up. You know, nothing else matters. All that matters is football, and that's it's a lifestyle mm-hmm. for them and your for us. Lucas, uh, I promise I'm not just saying this because you're here, but I really enjoy watching strikers who play like you do with that kind of edge and, and intensity about you. Um, you know, when I was in England covering the Premier League, I was lucky enough to see a lot of good players, but the one who really stood out to me and was most exciting to me was Luis Suarez, just for similar reasons, really. Um, you know, just never stops running, horrible to play against for, for defenders. 
I, I wondered what kind of makes you that way. Is it something that's ingrained in you or was your experience in Uruguay crucial for that? Yeah. Uh, just, I guess in Uruguay, the kids uh, who want to become footballers, they just all, football for them is a lifestyle. And that's what I, I took it as as well. Um, you know, obviously it's different compared to me because um, I grew up, I didn't, I wasn't rich, I wasn't poor. I like whatever I like needed, I had, but you know, nothing more than that. And obviously these guys, uh, in order for them to support their families, uh, they had to go try and make a living out of football. And uh, you know, there's a lot of footballers now, big names, Suarez, all came from poor places, you know? So mm -hmm. they had to go and fight for their family. Uh, it's something different compared to what us Canadians do. It's a different lifestyle, as I said, different culture. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, in, in Nacional, uh, there was a, there was one of the trainers there that he told me, I was like, you, you know, you remind me of Suarez. You know, just try to, try to copy him, try to be more like him, you know, watch him, watch him play. And that's what I did growing up. And, you know, I try to copy his style and stuff like that. So maybe you can say, it's something uh, comparable, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, I believe that's what uh, made you so appealing to the Vancouver Whitecaps, and that's a big reason why uh, you're in Vancouver now. Uh, but looking at your time with the national team now, uh, and specifically coach John Herdman, uh, what's his style like, and what have you appreciated about uh, playing under him with the Canadian men's national team? Yeah, you know, with John, we have a good relationship. He has a good relationship with all his players, and he's serious of what he's serious about um, about the, the future of Canada, and uh, it's something that we needed. It's something that the country needs, and uh, we need to change the face of Canada. And we're going in the right path right now. And John's John's really motivated with with what he has. Uh, he's just happy with all of us, and you know we're. We're, we're almost there, you know, it's still a lot, long way to go, but uh, we're on the right track. And, and John's been, been doing the Gareth Wheeler show on Tuesday, Lucas, and he met and, and the different styles of game that have influenced him as a coach. He mentioned his appreciation for the way the Brazilians play and just that sort of South American flair that he wasn't seeing in England. So having played in South America and playing for a coach internationally who likes that kind of style, do you find there are a lot of similarities or are there still pretty distinct differences between your club coaches and now with John? Oh, you, they're, they're similar. Uh, I, I, I can see that now. Um, yeah, you can... I can compare them a lot with the coaches I've I've had in, in South America and all that, but it's something good, you know. It's something something that changes our, our team. Uh, it gives us a different uh, character, and um, and that's what we're trying to show. I guess that's what John wants 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 us to demonstrate on the pitch. And you know, if if, if we can be able to do that, it's, it's something great. Um, yeah. you know, it's it's gonna. We're on the we're on the right track, you know. Yeah. Still got a long yeah. way to go, but but you know, it, this is a process, and yeah, obviously, since John uh, took over as coach, uh, everything is going uphill. Yeah, it's been fun to watch as well. A very entertaining brand of soccer right now. Um, we want to get you back to your family. We thank you for coming on with us, Lucas. But we do have to get to one thing uh, done before you go. We were talking about this uh, before you came on. Uh, the best three-on-three -three team of all time. We had quite the debates. Uh, we'll give you a bit of time to think about it. Let's get uh, Adam's three-on-three, all-time three-on-three team right now. No rules. You don't need a keeper. You can have all three keepers. Kurt's not here to change rules on us, so it's open. Yeah, that, that was my biggest question before we got on <laughs> air is how many different parameters were there right. for this? Okay, so just so we're clear, it no is parameters. three attacking players, no goalkeepers, yeah. anything you want. That's the way to do it. Well, you can um, have a defender if you like. Yeah, sorry, yeah, for yeah. outfield players is, is the better players. word there. Yeah, okay, right. three defenders. Uh, I went with a one, one. Yeah, <laughs> not in a Volta football style game. Okay, one defender, <laughs> um, Beckenbauer, and then my two attackers, Messi and Pele. I just um, wanted uh, for Pele. I've heard all the rumors, the legacy, the myth 
um, or not rumors is the wrong word too, but just the hype. I want to see it in action. And I think three on three, you can really see him succeed. Messi, you almost don't even need to explain why he's a good pick in such a, in a quick game and a game with footwork being required. And then Beckenbauer just being one of the best defenders of all time will take care of things back there. And he can join in the attack. Okay. Um, I, I've also got Messi. I think that goes without saying. I don't need to, to explain that one. For a bit more of a defensive presence, I'm going with Paolo Maldini. I just think he can play. Wow. He can play all across the back line. Good with both feet. He can. He's good on the ball as well as defensively. So I think he'd be good in this format. And then next to Messi, uh, ahead of Maldini, I'm going with the Brazilian Ronaldo, who I think would just be unstoppable in a, in a three-on-three setting. I don't think anyone's getting close to him. So that would be my three. I like it. All right, Lucas, you got it. You got three. He basically took my pick right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver took my pick. Ronaldo? Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. The whole thing. Oh, there, wow. the there you go. There you go. Love it. Oliver Platt, mind reader. I'm going to put that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, do you, what do you consider when you build this uh, three on three team, Lucas? Sorry? Well, what are you considering when you're building this three on three team? What do you want them? What kind of energy? What do you, how do you want them to play? All attack, pure attack. <laughs> Maldini is there just to take anything out, but he can, go, he can go up and down, up and down the pitch, yeah. no problem. Love it, good. You got to um, remember, though, there's no goalkeepers, so the defensive presence has to really defend. Everyone has to play defense, too. Just saying. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Not disagreeing. So. I don't know if Pelé is going to be doing much defending in your team. No, <laughs> I don't expect that whatsoever. <laughs> How about, uh, I'll go with um, Johan Cruyff. Carlos Valderrama mm -hmm. and Rude Hullet. Just be fun to watch. Valderrama. <laughs> yeah. Valderrama's a little outlandish, but I like Cray. Oh, it'd just be fun to watch in the middle there. <laughs> not, not running at all. So good. <laughs> a team uh, of good, good hair, but I don't know if it's going to beat, uh, going to beat Minor Adams or Lucas's. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> just for sheer entertainment. And yeah, uh, yeah the, the ability to just watch these guys together. Well, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on with us. Uh, an absolute pleasure. We'll have to do this again. Uh, we appreciate everyone for watching our One Soccer Hangout. Uh, Gareth Wheeler as a special guest tonight. I'm hearing it's Alexia Lawless, so that should be good. And Adam Jenkins is back on the Hangout tomorrow. And he's got a happy birthday mention, I believe. Andy, Andy Petrillo, right? buddy. Yeah. One Petrillo Soccer's finest. Great. I had to get that in there. Sure. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for coming on, guys. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Stay safe.